So about a year and a bit ago at my first talk that I had the privilege to do at LeaderX, I was talking around the impact of tax on retirement income and planning and all of those good things. And then I have this good friend, Tian Herselman, who just takes things to a next level. Now, he definitely did not do this because of me. This is a study that they have done uh, through Old Mutual Wealth and uh, something that he was looking at. And uh, today we're going to get into all the details of this amazing uh, sort of study that they did and all of the things. And we're going to simplify it for you today, distill it down to what are the most important things that we need to understand when it comes to retirement planning and the income of tax on that. So uh, looking forward to a great show. So let's get started. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome back. Uh, I just uh, was standing here while the intro was playing and I'm going like, geez, I've got to up my energy. <laughs> this year is getting really, really long. It's like so, sort of almost the third year this year. Uh, but anyway, good morning and a warm welcome to today's show. Really looking forward to chatting to Tian. Uh, it's going to be a very insightful discussion around this and I promise we're going to make it as simple as we, we possibly can. Uh, and uh, just to sort of highlight what are the most important aspects for us to consider when it comes to the impact of tax over the long term? So we're talking about different withdrawal rates and different options and, you know, what do you do when this happens and that happens? And like, it's going to be an interesting discussion. Let me just leave it at that. But anyway, so uh, we also have a full house in terms of our segments this morning. So first, we've got Nikki McDonald from the Financial Planning Institute, uh, which they, uh, I think she must also be tired because she's uh, just come back from the amazing FBI convention that uh, we had the privilege to attend. So uh, we've got Nikki here with all the latest news. And uh, of course, the world doesn't stand still when you hold conventions, right? And then we've got uh, Norma. So looking forward to Norma's segment this morning. We've got Quibus in the house this morning with Accelerate Your Brand. Looking forward to that as well. Got some, always have some announcements. You know that by now. So uh, I will definitely be sharing some new things with you. Some incredible announcements about things that we're launching and starting. Um, and uh, also uh, some upcoming uh, events that uh, you need to know about. But anyways, uh, on that note, I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Let me say a warm good morning. Uh, Mr. Terence Tobin in from Bloemfontein all the way. Oh, he's driving back now from Joburg. Fantastic. Uh, so Terence has been attending a lot of, of, of our things from, from Bloemfontein this, uh, this week. So thank you very much for that, uh, Terence. Johan Vasson, goeiemorgen. We hope it's going good. Neil Phillips, good morning. Hope it's going well. Uh, Ferry, good morning. Goeiemorgen. Uh, we've got Johan Potgieter. Goeiemorgen, Johan. We hope it's going good over you. Johan Blumeres. All the Johans in the house again today. Good morning, good morning. Uh, we've got Francis. Uh, goeiemorgen, Francis. Uh, we've got Nico van Wijk, good morning. Uh, Heloise, good morning, uh, Heloise. And then Adrian Jordan, good morning. Goeiemorgen. Alrighty, so let's get this party started. If it, we could call it a party, it is most of the time. So uh, let's head on over to Nikki and hear what the latest is in our profession. <music> Good morning, everybody. And yes, thank you, Francois. We are struggling a bit this morning. Um, it has been a very, very long week, but I must say it was one of the best conventions that FBI had ever hosted, in my opinion. So um, I will touch on some of the highlights that happened at um, the gala dinner specifically in the news this morning, because I think it's important that we spread the news on our prize winners. But first of all, as Francois said, the world has not been standing still while we've been at Santum Convention Center. So there was one new warning that was issued by the Financial Sector Conduct Authority this week. They warned the public to be cautious when taking up guarantee insurance policies issued by Lereku Brokers, PTY Limited. Now, it's interesting to see that there are also issues, not just with advice that are given by people who are not registered, but actually 
guaranteed insurance policies that are issued that is not supposed to be. So the FSEA received complaints that the RECO may be issuing guarantee insurance policies to members of the public which were possibly not un underwritten by an authorized short-term insurer. Without commenting on the business of Lareku or its products and services, because it seems Lareku is a registered FSP, the FSEA points out that for a company to issue insurance policies in South Africa, it must be authorized by the Prudential Authority. So we'll keep an eye on how that unfolds. Now, what I wanted to do this morning is just to touch on um, what happened at our gala dinner at on Tuesday night. As you know, the FPI awards a certain number of prizes and awards, not really prizes, more awards to our members that have um, either entered some of our competitions or people who have done something for the industry. So I just wanted to recap on who received our awards this year. Now, as you have probably heard, our winner of the FBI 2023 Financial Planner of the Year is Laura War Warburton from Integral Wealth. I want to say congratulations to, Laura, congratulations to Laura again. It really is quite a difficult competition. Um, if you look at the level of scrutiny that you are placed under, it is very um, demanding to get through the process and come out on top. We then also had our 2023 Professional Practice of the Year um, Award, and that went to Crew Invest from Cape Town. The other two nominees in this category were Integral Wealth and um, Veritas Wealth. The Professional Competency Examination Top Student Award went to Stefan Lombard. Now, I must tell you that uh, obviously this, is, this sits in my space at FBI. And Stefan um, did extremely well and scored the best score in the PCE over three examinations. So it is not a... It's quite a mean feat. Then there is a award that we call It Starts With Me. This recognizes an individual who endorses the CFP mark and the professionalism that accompanies the mark, embedded in everything they do. This was awarded to Kim Pothitter from Chartered Wealth. The Harry Bruce Award is um, to recognize an individual who makes a significant contribution to the financial planning profession through service to society, academia, training, government, media, and other professional activities. And this year, this was awarded to Rob McDonald, who is our 2023 Harry Bruce Award winner. Then the other award that we um, annually um, award to one of our members is the Diversity and Inclusion Award. This is for someone who has had a significant impact on individuals, communities, or organizations, promoting inclusivity and creativity within the financial planning profession. Our FBI Diversity and Inclusion Award winner was or is for this year all the way to Masanabu, who is also one of our FBI board members. And then something I am ve personally very excited about, there was a new award this year. FBI relaunched the Student Financial Plan Competition. So how did we do that? We gave full-time student teams from our education providers who offer qualifications in financial planning across South Africa a chance to enter this comp competition. These teams then received a case study that they had to work through. After they worked through the case study, we provided a 45-minute Teams meeting with the client to ask additional questions. Now, I must tell you that the clients were um, played or acted um, by, by two of our staff members, Patrick and Fatima, and it was actually brilliant to see how these young students interacted with them because we really tried to build some friction, you know, and disagreement into the meeting because the husband and the wife just could not decide what to do and what not to do. So the plan was then submitted, assessed, and the top three plan teams were asked to present their plans to a panel of judges on Monday afternoon this week. Two teams from UJ and one from Nelson Mandela University formed our top teams and they were absolutely brilliant. They spent Tuesday at the convention and the winners were awarded their prizes at gala dinner. 
The top team was MSK Financial Services from the University of Johannesburg. We intend to host this event annually, so let us know if you want to get involved next year. It was so much fun to see these young students um, presenting their plans and making recommendations and engaging with the community at the convention. And on that note, Francois, have a wonderful weekend. And it's almost end of the year, so not too long to push through. Thank you. Awesome stuff and a big congratulations to all the winners. And talking about winners, we're also giving away three coffee hampers today. Uh, that's in the lucky draw for those that uh, did complete our technology survey uh, that uh, closed yesterday. So we are going to do that draw today live here on the show as well. So there's going to be three lucky winners today. So looking forward to that as well. Uh, but massive congratulations, uh, especially to Rob McDonald. Uh, that is a lifetime of a contribution to a profession and uh, he is an incredible person we had him in uh, on here last week uh yvette to follow <laughs> didn't know that that was going to happen so uh timing is everything uh, even if you don't do it intentionally uh but big congratulations to him and all the other winners as well uh specifically also all way to she's a, an amazing person uh, for those of you that know her so uh, but uh, big congratulations as well as laura for winning the financial plan of the year all righty ladies and gentlemen next up we have norma and uh, today norma is talking about the dynamic duo that is crucial for achieving our objectives so looking forward to this Good morning and excited to be back uh, with my segment. Now, have you ever been in a situation where you maybe read a book or you listen to someone's story and you think to yourself, wow, that's amazing, I wanna do that. And we say to ourselves, I'm gonna start on Monday or I'm gonna start on the first or this is the year that I'm gonna do this thing. I'm gonna make my health a priority. And then we start taking a little bit of action and our enthusiasm wanes a little bit. And then somewhere down the line, we see, well, it's quite hard. It's quite challenging. Um, you know, maybe, is this the right time for me to be doing this? Is this the right time to be spending so much time on this thing? And then we silently quit. And then we sort of move on to the next thing. Now, this is exactly what I want to talk to you about today. Because we are so easy to label ourselves. We look back at things that we promised ourselves. And then we tell ourselves that, you know what? I don't, I'm not a person that, that pushes through. I don't follow through on what I promise myself. And that's so unnecessary because sometimes we don't make the distinction between what is really a goal and what is just a wish or something nice to have or something nice to do. So this brings me to my topic today, this dynamic deal that is so helpful when we are looking at achieving our goals. Now, I think the first part of this deal is definitely for us to set goals. And to set goal is to fix a goal. It's to set a target for ourselves. So that's quite important because it tells us in what direction we need to go to. Now, we need to clarify, is this thing really a goal or is it just, just a nice to have? Does it just sound good in the moment? Does it just sound like a good idea now? Because then, as I mentioned in the example, then we're going to take a little bit of action. When it gets hard, we're gonna stop. So we need to fix the goal. So when we fix the goal and we set the goal, we actually have to decide and commit to it. Now, if you look at the real definition of these words, they're quite amazing. So the root meaning of the word decide is to cut off. So it means I'm cutting myself off from any, any other alternative or any other option or any other possibility. When I look at the root meaning of commitment, it means that I, am, I bring stuff together. And also what I like about what the Oxford Dictionary says, it says that it's an obligation that restricts freedom of action. So I already know when I'm making the commitment that I'm cutting myself off from a lot of things that I'm not going to be doing. And I'm going to focus on the stuff that I want to be doing that's going to get me there. Now, this is the part where we sort of look at the person that we're becoming, uh, about the person we're becoming, about the mindset, about the attitude um, that we need to create to actually go and do the next part. So the second part of this duo is then the routines. Now, this is the doing part. Now, this routines is necessary, as you know, in your own life uh, for getting any results in our lives. If you look at your own life and you think of areas of success, 
there are definitely routines in those areas. Otherwise, we wouldn't have success. Now, when I talk about routines, it is something that happens automatically. I don't even have to think about it. It's also I don't negotiate with myself. I do it. Even when I don't feel like it, I do it. And even when it is con inconvenient, I still do it. So that's really what this whole process is of a routine. It is something that is hard up front, but it gets easier over time. So we have the choice. Either we can decide to do the hard, front, uh, hard thing right now and make it easier over time, or we take the easy route now and have to deal with the hard things in a year or 10 or 20's time. Now, we're going into this time of year where we start thinking about where we want to, want to go next year, what our priorities are for 2024. And if we can be honest with ourselves, what is really a priority? What is the goal that I want to set for myself? Then decide and commit to that goal and then start building routines that will support me into achieving that goal by the end of the year where I can look back and say to myself, wow, I've achieved this. I trust myself because I keep my promises that I make to myself. So that's what I have for you today. Have a great weekend. I'll be back next week. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Norma. Uh, appreciate it very much. Right, next up we have Kubis. And uh, Kubis today is uh, talking about, you, you know, personal branding as a retirement strategy. So we're obviously looking, always looking forward to what Kubis has to share with us. So let's head on over to Bitstream and hear what Kubis has for us. At least he's not next to the Vol River today. He is in his studio. So here we go. Good morning, everyone who's listening live this morning or to this recording afterwards. It's a privilege to engage financial stakeholders who are shaping the future of financial planning and advice. Today, we go into a topic of importance, namely the power of personal branding and its profound impact on our and our clients' future retirement and tax planning. This conversation is crucial considering the unique challenges and opportunities we face in our profession. Following my talk, Tian will have a detailed conversation with Francois on tax impacts and opportunities around retirement planning, further enriching my discussion with his expert insights. The importance of branding with building your practice and planning your own future retirement must not be underestimated. Personal branding is not only a tool, it is a cornerstone of our professional journey. It encapsulates more than our abilities, services, and value proposition. It reflects our values, our approach to client relationships, and our standing in our community and profession. A strong personal brand differentiates us in a competitive financial services planning and advice environment. It is about creating a brand that resonates with trust, competence, and consistency. Our branding is crucial in ensuring that clients do not just start their financial journey with us, but choose to continue it with us year after year as we navigate through the complexities of financial markets, changing regulations, and evolving client needs. Our branding and advice practice must evolve on a continuous basis so that it stays relevant to our clients and our clients stay with us. When this becomes second nature, it allows us to build a new to income and value in our practice over the long term. Now, how do we link branding to retirement planning and tax? Our personal brand is indirectly linked to the success of our own tax effective retirement planning. It's not just about the current efficiency and profitability of our practice. It's about demonstrating the effectiveness of our strategies through our own actions over the long term with our clients. By planning our own retirement and taking advantage of many of the tax benefits during retirement planning, we showcase to our clients the importance of foresight and planning. This strategy is two-pronged. Firstly, by maintaining a robust practice for a strong brand, we ensure a steady income stream for our semi and final retirement years with solid annuity income. 
by using ourselves as examples to our clients and living a lifestyle around it, we can be living proof of what is possible. Secondly, in the event of selling our practice, a well-established brand and annuity income can significantly amplify its market value. By living out the strategies we advocate, we reinforce our credibility and commitment to financial planning, making our advice more tangible and relatable to our clients. By writing thought leadership articles on retirement planning and associated tax planning, we can enhance our brand as an expert on the subject matter. As we explore the aspects of branding and retirement planning, it's imperative to recognize the significant role that tax plays in this equation. In financial services, there's always change, and especially with evolving tax laws at every budget speech by the Minister of Finance. Understanding and navigating these changes and taking advantage of opportunities while mitigating negatives is critical for effective retirement planning, not only for ourselves, but certainly for our clients as well. This is where Tian's expertise becomes invaluable. His upcoming conversation will provide a thorough exploration of tax-related challenges and opportunities. He will guide us through strategies that can be employed to maximize tax efficiency in our retirement planning, ensuring that we are well-equipped to advise ourselves and our clients with up-to-date and strategic tax insights. So our journey towards a secure and prosperous retirement is multidimensional and our branding is directly connected to its long-term success. It involves not only the cultivation of a robust and impactful personal brand, but also embodying the principles and strategies we advocate in our professional capacity. As we look forward to Tian's insights on tax strategies, let us reflect on how we can integrate these learnings into our practices. By doing so, we do not only enhance our professional growth but also embed the trust our clients place in us. Thank you for listening, and I'm keenly looking forward to the enriching discussions and insights that will emerge from today. Over to you, Francois and Tia. Thank you very much, Kobus. Really appreciate it. Uh, great segment. And thank you very much. So to everybody, Nikki, uh, Norma and Kobus, uh, thanks all for all the prep and all the time. Really appreciate it. Uh, you have some great segments today. Righty, next up, I've got a few announcements and all everything is, is, is exciting, right? So <laughs> like in my world, everything's always exciting. So let's head on over and see. Fantastic. Righty. So first things first, uh, you will see there's an email that's about to go out in the next seven minutes or so. And uh, there's some stuff on my WhatsApp status as well that is talking about uh, tax space. And uh, we're going to do a session on tax space in practice. What is tax space? Well, tax space is uh, our own software that we developed uh, about in 2016, I think is when I did it. Uh, for a long time, it was a, an Excel spreadsheet uh, that we uh, did, and uh, it has all sorts of things where we use tax to open up opportunities and change conversations. So it's not about calculating somebody's tax, although that's it does that as well. It's all the other things it then goes and identifies off the back of that and puts it in a very nice report. Uh, but that's also not the only thing that it does. A lot of people think this is only about that. I'm going to show you on Wednesday exactly how to use this tool to also, uh, you know, when you do living annuity reviews or you do investment planning or retirement planning for clients uh, and some other things as well. So uh, do join us for that. Uh, it's at one o'clock on Wednesday, so in lunchtime. Uh, for those people in the Platteland who still takes lunch, us Oaks in the, in the city does not really get to, to take lunch at any time. But uh, you are more than welcome. Uh, the link is down in the description, so you can go and register for that and uh, we're not recording it won't be available afterwards it's a live session and that's it so uh, that's tax space in practice uh, next week wednesday at one o'clock in the afternoon then next up is connect in durban looking forward to going to durban and uh, my special guest is going to be mandy murphy and uh, mandy and i will be talking about uh, how to punch above your weight uh, so really looking forward to that discussion with her 
And uh, we also have some other special guests that is joining us. And uh, looking forward to that at the Riverside Hotel on Friday next week. So don't go there today because we won't be there. <laughs> like I rocked up to, to, to an event last week, the day before it was actually happening. So please don't do that. Uh, but we'll see you in Durban uh, next week. So really looking forward to that. The registration's closed today. There's still four more seats left. So uh, if you haven't booked yet, uh, then do do that. Uh, and if you, if you are in Durban, I know there's a few Durban people here on the call. If they, if you know a few people, uh, do uh, please, you know, ask them very nicely to join us. All righty. So um, also just on that note, thank you very much to Independent Investment Solutions for helping us cover some of the cost in terms of the venues, as well as Profile Me for also doing that to help us pay some of the food. And uh, we really, really appreciate it. It helps a lot with these uh, because there's no commercial intent behind the Connect events. It's all about bringing people together, having great conversations and uh, seeing how people then uh, reconnect and re-engage with each other. It's been incredible the last two. So uh, definitely uh, that's what it's all about. Then uh, financial, financial, financial planning tools and techniques. We did the, uh, the second last module uh, this week with Steve, and next week is the last module. We also finished the Microsoft 365 training series, uh, the champion certificate this week. Uh, the last thing we spoke about was security. So, uh, yeah, six weeks just flew by. It's, uh, it's, it's crazy what you can do if you, if you just break things down. You think six weeks, oh, it's going to take forever, and then no, it doesn't. It's like it's in the blink of an eye. And it is over and done with. So looking forward to the next chapter in the Microsoft training, which we will announce in due course. Uh, but there's some amazing things that's happening at the moment. Been spending time at Microsoft Ignite virtually uh, the last two days. So yeah, it's been, uh, there's a lot of stuff happening. And I can tell you a lot of the things that's making me nauseous at the moment, just because I hear too much about it, is uh, it's not going away. It's actually now becoming real. And it's something that's going to stick around. This is the biggest sort of opportunity and the biggest change that has come from a technology point of view anyway since the launch of the iPhone. Before the launch of the iPhone, it was sort of when the internet came back in 1993. Uh, before that, it was the personal computer in the early 80s. So, you know, it's all of these things that are like there's these moments and you either take advantage of them or you don't. So definitely something that you're going to hear us talk more about. And on that note, by the way, we are launching uh, quite a few new shows. Uh, so one of them will be available publicly and the rest of them are only for our members. <clears throat> but uh, we're launching the Tech Stack Podcast. So Tech Stack Podcast, we, can, we are already busy interviewing people from around the globe uh, that are experts in the field of technology and artificial intelligence and all of those good things. And I know one of the biggest challenges at the moment for people is this, wow, there's so many options and I can't keep up. And it's like, so our whole mission with this is to make it simple and to take out all the noise and focus on the things that are really important to know. And if I look at what people are telling me around where they struggle with technology, those are exactly the things that we're going to focus on with this. So this isn't just about saying, oh, here's another tool. Here's another tool. Here's another tool. And now you need to go get a, a, a virtual bag to put all your tools in. So we're not doing that. So this is all about helping you make the most out of your technology know which ones you want. And ultimately, I'm now on a mission to consolidate the tech stacks and make them simpler and make them smaller and uh, not uh, having you feel like you bloated after a good Christmas dinner or lunch or something like that. So that's happening. So the Tech Stack podcast, that's going to be available publicly. It's a worldwide podcast. Uh, so we're doing it uh, in, in collaboration with the UK. So uh, it's a global, global podcast. Then we're also launching uh, the following shows just for members. So the first one would be the Tech Stack Show. So the Tech Stack Show is going to be a live show only available to our members. And uh, we're going to delve deeper uh, in that show into other aspects. We, we have a fun thing. There's three of us. It's myself, Amelia Hamilton, and Adam Carolan. And it's going to be a fun show. We're going to make jokes. We're going to play around with ideas. We're going to take deep dives. We're going to let... Amelia go back to the future because if you don't know Amelia, she's still uh, you know fairly young, uh, you know at least in relation to me. And uh, we're going to see if she knows what certain of these old things were meant to do, and if she can even recognize what it is or figure out what it is. So we're really looking forward to an incredible uh, fun show. Just thirty minutes. It's going to be fun. Um, then Adam and I are going to do the financial advice show next year. <clears throat> so that's launching. So by the way, Tech Stack Podcast, Tech Stack Show launching now, end of November. And then the financial advice show we're going to do next year. And then we're going to be interviewing 
people from across the, the world again about how they run their practices and sort of get insights and things from there. But we'll announce more around that. And then the last show that we're launching is Chat FDT. Now, how freaking cool is that? Once, once in my life, my name works. Because <laughs> usually, like, you know, it's cool when somebody has like these cool little names or or they can use just their uh, the first letters of their name and surname, and it actually makes sense. So finally, FDT helps me. Uh, so we're launching Chat FDT, and what we're going to do with Chat FDT is delve into the podcast episodes that we did with TechStack and uncover some of the things that the guests have have, have shared. And and so TechStack show, the financial advice show, as well as Chat FDT is only going to be for our members, but the podcast will be available to everyone. Then the last thing, so Tian is waiting anxiously to talk to me. Um, so uh, we are launching a book, and uh, the book is going to be launched on the 23rd of February. Uh, this is a book for the profession. Uh, I'm not going to give away the name. I can tell you that 14 people came together, wrote this book, and uh, it's finally ready to be published. And we're going to launch it officially in person in Pretoria on the 23rd of Feb. So look out. We'll send you the save the dates, more information, and all of that good stuff. So really looking forward to that. But on that note, I'm going to shut up now because I need to talk to Tian. So ladies and gents, thank you very much for being here. Uh, after I've spoken to Tian, we're going to do the lucky draw. I'm going to announce who my guest is next week. I'm going to wish you a good weekend. But before that, let's first chat to Tian. <laughs> Tian, my good friend, good morning, warm welcome to Propulsion Life, or well, welcome back. It's been like a, a lifetime, but welcome back. Good morning, good morning. It is absolutely fantastic to be here, Franch. I think your show always gives me an energy that, uh, I don't know where it comes from, but I think it's your energy that also somehow is transformed into my screen, and I can just feel it here. I've even got my, my Batman mug this morning already. Fantastic. I'm I'm on uh, Captain America today, but okay. there you go. <laughs> so uh, good stuff, <laughs> Tian. I mean, you are on the show back in season one. If people missed that, really go back and have a look. You and Yvonne Killian were, were, were on the show together. Uh, we had some fantastic conversations between the planning side and the coaching side, etc. So that was a very very uh, interesting conversation. And then uh, I had the privilege to sort of uh, obviously now run into you quite a few times, not literally, because Shav, I think <laughs> if you run into me, <laughs> it's not going to end well. Um, <laughs> um, so, so the, um, but I mean, you've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, the impact of tax on the retirement planning, yeah. and it's something that's very close to my heart as well, because it is, it's like I said on the on the thumbnail, right? So, so if I where's the thumbnail, I can show that just if people miss that. So I said four numbers and a leak. Right. So because tax is not a good thing and uh, it's not something that's often avoidable, but we've got to understand the impact and how that influences our decisions. And, and what bothers me Tian, the most is probably that a lot of times advisors are ignoring it because no, that's the tax practitioner's job or the accountant's job or whoever, you know, um, and, and this is why this, this conversation is important to me. But before we get going, you are the head of advice at Old Mutual Wealth. Uh, what does that entail exactly when you're the head of advice and what is it that you actually do on a daily basis except like travel a lot and walk a lot? Uh, what does it actually entail? Yeah, thanks, Francho. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And, and maybe just I, I would love to just start off and say congratulations to uh, all the winners at the at the FBI uh, Gala Awards. Um, yeah, to Laura or where to uh, Rob Crew Invest, great practice. Congratulations. But yeah, basically my, my role is all about the betterment and demonstrating the value of advice. So there's two components. The one is how do we do that through fintech? How do you do that through the use of technology? Um, equipping financial planners to demonstrate their value. And the second component is thought leadership, whereby I tend to speak a lot such as topics such as tax or retirement planning and all the kind of nuanced topics where there seems to be quite a bit of debate. Um, I quite enjoy taking them on and, and then to hopefully use data and some some models and number crunching to kind of validate some of the arguments or potentially open up discussion for more arguments. So basically two things in a nutshell. I look at the fintech capabilities that we have at Old Mutual Wealth and also a lot of thought leadership specifically on the topic of advice because I do think significant value can be added through a financial planner and we see it more and more and more with clients. If you just consider clients that don't have financial planners uh, and clients that do. So that's in a nutshell, um, I guess, what I do. But my, my passion has always been 
financial planning. Um, I think I I found this industry as my first love. So went to go study financial planning off the off the get go. So yeah, I think my first my first ever paid um, paid job was in financial planning. So yeah, it, it's always been a been a love of mine. Yeah, also man. And and you you can see the passion. That's always one thing to say you're passionate. It's quite a quite another level when one starts seeing that passion, Tian. So so that's absolutely incredible. And on stage, you are on fire always. Like it's, I like you. You say in half an hour what people would usually say in an hour. Like that, that's the energy. So it's absolutely amazing, and it's a it's a good thing, by the way. Um, but so, so one of the things that uh, you always sort of start off with or talk about a lot, and I've thought about it quite a bit. Uh, you were also part of our cash flow modeling winter camp that we did for for the propulsion members, and one of the big things is that there are basically four numbers that drive a financial plan there are four numbers or four levers i think that you as you call it that we can play with and change etc can you talk us through that a little bit yeah so i i think the the biggest thing we, we struggle in our in our industry is because it's such a complex topic financial plan um and it's not something that clients wake up every morning going oh i, I can't wait to talk about my my financial plan and the, the concept of the four numbers is actually something that's been coming along for quite some time. And our entire goal was how do we simplify financial planning for clients? And and any financial plan, and, and I sometimes sound like a broken recording if you've heard me before, but it can basically, basically be summarized into just four numbers. And the four numbers is firstly your assets number, so your properties, your investments, your businesses. Uh, the second number is the lifestyle. So what do you want this asset base to support? Do you see yourself living inland at the coast? What's your after-tax amount that you need? Do you have big liquid goals? Will your kids still be at home? Uh, do you see yourself traveling abroad? So what is the ideal lifestyle you'd like to support? And then there's the third number, which is, well, what kind of a return do you expect this capital base or asset base to achieve? And that usually gives you the fourth number, which is, well, how long can this capital base sustain this lifestyle? Now, the great thing, and, and I think part of what financial planning does for clients is that we can calculate any one of the four numbers, as long as we know what the other three are. So in very simple terms, if I knew somebody had a million rand to invest, they wanted to maybe draw an income of 5,000 rand a month, uh, they were trying to target the return of call it seven or 8%, we could then calculate how long the money could last. But very interesting, and, and which kind of leads into this topic today is, in this four numbers, we've seen that in the assets number, the first one of the four numbers, the one element that has a significant impact on outcomes for clients is tax. Because your, your taxation on whether you go into retirement funds or discretionary money, that has quite a big impact. And that's quite an important decision for clients to take into account as to what structure do I go into? And there's almost three elements in, in kind of retirement planning, if I can call it that. It's this balance between tax efficiency, liquidity, and that inevitably leads to income longevity. And we've been trying, or we've, we've done quite a bit of research in, into this particular area to kind of see what impact does tax planning actually have. And I completely agree with you, Francho. It is something as a financial planner, you should be taking into account for every single client. And also just to illustrate to them what the what the impact of that is on your financial plan. Um, and we've done a bit of work on that, but I, I think we've probably done 0.5% of the work that still needs to be done on this, which is quite a nuanced and quite technical topic. Um, as that. Yeah. And Tian, I mean, if we then sort of get to the uh, part where look, I'm about to hang up my boots, not permanently, just I've, I've worked enough, I'm going to retire now. Um, yeah. You know, if I think on my road from now until retirement, I mean, there's tax consequences, right. implications or aspects that I need to consider. Um, what are some of those that uh, are really important for, for our retirement plan? Yeah. So there's basically, you can almost call it pre-retirement and post-retirement, right? So pre-retirement, and I'm going to simplify kind of the investment vehicles available to, to clients. But if you were to look at pre-retirement, you can you can kind of say, well, there's probably four types of vehicles you could consider. There's your retirement funds, being your retirement annuity, pension, provident funds. And then there's your tax-free savings accounts. Then there's, we'll call it discretionary, being unit trust, share portfolios, cash investments. And then you've got endowments or life-wrapped investments. Now, if you were to kind of look at pre-retirement, you'd probably say, well, by far the most tax efficient is your retirement funds. Because as most of us know, every one rand you contribute up to certain limits, you get a tax deduction from SARS. So if you had to rank them almost from most tax efficient to least tax efficient pre-retirement, it would most likely be your retirement funds. And then secondly, you can probably argue that it's a tax-free savings account, although there's obviously some limits. Uh, I think it's a fantastic vehicle. 
and then it's normally a bit of a bit of a coin toss uh, between, and this is hot off the, the Proteas uh, match last night, which we won't discuss. Um, but then it's a coin toss usually between unit trust, cash saving, share portfolios versus the endowment. And that usually depends on where the client falls in the income tax bracket what the effective tax rate is, where they fall into the marginal tax brackets. And in most cases, it's probably unit trusts and then endowments, or it could be the other way around. But when you get to post-retirement, it's almost like we flip this completely on its, on its head. Because in post-retirement, the significant tax benefits you get from the retirement funds are now flipped on its head. Because now every one range you draw as an income is fully taxable. So post-retirement, it's usually... Then in that case, the tax-free savings account is then the clear winner because obviously it'd be one rand you draw. There's no tax on interest, dividends, or capital gains. And then it's usually either the unit trust, uh, savings, shares, then the endowment. Now, again, the endowment might move up a little bit earlier depending on where you fall um, in the income tax brackets. And then it's usually retirement funds unless you have disallowed contributions whereby you might be drawing a tax-free income. But in most cases, people don't have disallowed contributions. So then the question is, well, how do I look at both of these? Because I think what tends to happen is we tend to only focus in on pre-retirement. We say, look, it has to be retirement funds, and there are significant benefits to contributing to, to retirement funds pre-retirement. I don't think I have to go into that, but I think it's looking again at these three things, tax efficiency, liquidity, income longevity, if I were to ignore estate planning. I think that is a, a conversation in itself. Um, and then it's how do you mix those two? Now, before going to too much detail, where this kind of thought leadership came from is that our industry in answering this question, so we write, an, or I write an article in, it was 2020 or 2021 on MoneyWeb. And uh, you write a lot of articles and sometimes you are quite despondent because not a lot of people read it or there's not a lot of comments and you think, yes, I've put quite a couple of hours into this article. Nobody's really even asking me questions or you know, kind of going, great work. Um, and then we wrote this article on somebody who had 5,000 rand to invest, and we looked at different options, retirement annuity, um, endowment, unit trust with some tax assumptions, tax-free savings account, and who would be better off in retirement. But we took one client earning one income and trying to fund one expense. And this article, I, okay, I don't think a financial planning article has ever gone viral, but it got a lot of commentary from the industry. Um, almost so that um, I think it was it was at the FBI's convention where Bessel Oersteisen actually said to me, look, I'd love to discuss this article because I can see there's quite a lot of debate happening. And we always see debate as a good thing because it challenges, first of all, what we wrote, but it's also good for the industry to have different views because that's how we look at and ask ourselves critically, well, maybe we should have taken that point into account, or maybe there's a different angle to this topic. And then we said, okay, well, this article's gotten a lot of traction, a lot of, um, I like guess, spotlight. What kind of thought leadership is out there? What kind of academia is actually be considered in this kind of retirement tax planning space? And um, then we realized that right now, if you were to investigate a topic on financial planning, such as living versus life annuities, there is endless resources of academia. I mean, you can just in the essay context alone, if you were to look at uh, what's the volatility of equities over time versus maybe cash, again, endless academia. But we only found one piece of academia on this particular topic. And it was done in 2018 by the UCT School of Business. And I hope I can just share a slide because I really want to give them the credit because this is really where this entire thing started. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Um, and I really think it was a fantastic piece of work that they did. Um, it was done by um, Giselle Willows, who's now Dr. Giselle Willows. And Francia, can you see my screen? I just wanted to confirm if you can see my screen. Um, not yet. Uh, just make sure you share it again. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. You think that after? Oh, sorry. There we go. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you think that by by this time now we would we would be able to. Um, to get this right, right? There we go. But Shit. it's better than not finding the unmute button. So that's <laughs> <all right. laughs> Perfect. But, there you go. Uh, you see, UCT did a study in 2018. Now, uh, it was done by Giselle Willows and uh, Thomas Burgers and Darren West. And uh, she's now actually Dr. Giselle Willows. And they basically asked the question, well, in the Regulation 28 investment, and this is before the Regulation 28 changes are made, whereby you could even invest more offshore. But the question they were basically asking was something as follows. What is a different return that is required from a discretionary investment compared to retirement investment uh, over your career to make up for the tax you are paying on the discretionary investment, and that being tax on interest, dividends, and capital gains? And what kind of blew us away, or we were shocked 
by their findings was that they said that, well, for some investors, you actually could get a lower return in the discretionary investment. And for some investors, you had to earn a higher return. And it depended on where they fell on the income tax bracket. Uh, it depended on what their, what their income was uh, and a couple of factors. And we looked at this and finally the dots started connecting for us. Because in our, our cash flow modeling tools that we have at Old Mutual Wealth, we often see that clients that actually, in some cases, it makes more sense to go into retirement annuity, take the tax saving from SARS, invest that, and you are better off. In other cases, it made sense to go more into liquid uh, funds, a unit trust, tax savings account, maybe an endowment. And it was different for different clients. We realized that this is quite a nuanced subject, and maybe there was something to look into here. Uh, so what we then did is we said, okay, well, First of all, the article got a lot of feedback, um, got a lot of traction. What we are going to do is let's try and build a comprehensive model. Now, now again, a model is made up of a lot of assumptions, and we tried to look at two broad line scenarios. We said, well, let's look at clients that are saving in their personal capacity to a retirement annuity, whereby they actually get a tax refund from SARS at the end of the year. Now, if you if you're a provisional taxpayer, you can you can actually work that in on a potentially a monthly and quarterly basis, I would argue, but we assume that they got the tax saving back at the end of the year. And then we said there's another group of clients that work for employers, and because they are contributing to the employer retirement funds predominantly, they actually get the tax saving in that month as per PAYE. And then we basically looked across different clients, we looked across different incomes, um, and we said, what if you wanted to replace 60% of your gross income as a net income? And the findings were very interesting, Frantra. And um, yeah, I think this is where, where I'm just going to kind of summarize. And I'm, and I'm more than happy to come do the full presentation because it's about 40 or 50 slides. Um, but the findings basically told us one thing. And it, and it wasn't what's the best vehicle. It was basically how valuable financial planning and the tax impact of financial planning is for clients because the answers were different for different clients. If you were earning 500,000, and we took clients earning from 10,000 to 500,000, um, I would love to earn 500,000, but the answers varied. What we did notice though, was for younger clients, if you're in your 30s starting off. Now, we started at the age of 30 because I, I wish more people saved when they were younger, but I guess the bulk of individuals really start saving when they get to the age of 30. Um, we saw that there was a significant benefit if you were saving into retirement annuity and taking the tax saving that you got back from SARS and reinvesting that. It was it was significant. Um, maybe just to, to quickly show you that in, in one slide, um, and because I think the context here is important, what we asked is, okay, well, who could sustain this income for the longest after, after retirement? And let me just share my screen again. Uh, oh, I love technology, it's so easy and quick if you can do this. Um, so for clients, we, we, we actually had them at, in, in their 30s, and, and here's kind of what it looked like. And there's a whole bunch of lines here, and you can just ignore all the different, all the information. Basically, clients are earning 10,000 all the way to 500,000. The question is, how long can you sustain 60% of your gross income? And this retirement annuity here, where the tax saving is invested into the TFS and unit trust, significantly gave them the most amount of longevity. This is another potential. Age. You can see blue bar, blue bar, blue bar, blue bar, all the way. That was the better option. It was only really when you got to clients in the higher, higher income space, so 300,000, 400,000, 500,000, whereby just the tax was so high on the income you drew in retirement, that's where it started hurting you. And we took into account disallowed contributions because we assumed that all clients had an X percentage saving, which is about 20%. Um, and then we went further on, we looked at clients aged 40 and 50. And it was very interesting when we got to the clients aged 40, um, let me just get to that. Here, the mix was a little bit different. It was almost a, a neck and neck between the RA and discretionary funds. But the one thing I, I should point out here, and again, I'm not going through these graphs in a lot of detail because our time is limited. But all you need to know is that the blue bar here is the retirement annuity with the tax saving and all of the other colors here, the, the kind of called this um, reddish and orange is discretionary vehicles. And this is just the green is just a normal retirement annuity whereby you don't save the tax saving. Now, where you see these, these bar charts stop for discretionary capital is where you've reached a zero balance. So in this little, call it the red purple bar, that is the TFSA and unit trust for a client earning 40,000 rand a month. If they invested only into a TFSA and unit trust, at the age of 77, there's no more money. But in the retirement annuity, this is only the point where they've reached the 17.5% limit. 
So where, where it's a kind of an even match between the retirement annuity and discretionary funds, it doesn't mean that you've run out of money in the retirement annuity because you've gone into a living annuity. You've just reached a 17.5% cap. So we saw client stage 30, it was really the retirement annuity by far. Client stage 40, it was, it was a bit of a 50-50. And then the higher you went on the income, you really went to the higher incomes. It was more unit you know, trust and, and especially in the endowment really started shining. And then we've got the clients at the ages of 50 discretionary really came out on top because they actually didn't have enough time to benefit from the compounding in the retirement annuity, the, the tax-free growth that they were getting. And then because every one rand was taxed in retirement, we saw the discretionary funds here, which is these two bars really outperform. Um, now, again, I, I think what I want to preface here, because we don't have a lot of time and it's a very short conversation, we were only looking to answer one question which vehicle in a very simple illustration would give you the most amount of income longevity after tax replacing 60 percent of your gross income we did not consider estate planning that is obviously a very important consideration but we just thought in a country where less than six percent of people can actually afford to retire it was quite important to just answer that question first and foremost but we we came back at the end of it um, um uh, my actually and i and we said this just highlights all of the different factors in retirement because all we looked at here was somebody earning an income and looking to replace 60 percent we didn't look at the implication of having capital goals didn't look at the implication of maybe if you were to consider dropping your expenses at a later point in time what if you change your inflation rate later on what if you added medical aid inflation and there's so many variants and nuances that we can still build on top of this we also didn't add in here living versus life because you might make the argument that where interest rates are at the moment you could also convert to a life annuity and it just made us again realize what the value of advice is and how you almost cannot go on this on your own as a client because all we focused on was one element taxation we didn't look at um, different portfolios or local versus offshore we didn't look at things such as advanced cash flow modeling this is a very simple cash flow just looking at one income and one expense um, but it did open up our eyes that one thing became very clear there is no one investment vehicle as they say in the lord of the rings one ring to rule them all uh, there isn't one and it's different for different clients and i think in today's day and age having so much access to financial planning tools I mean, I've played on your tax tool and it's absolutely brilliant. Um, not because it calculates the tax. I think you made that point quite quite clearly, but because it shows you the various opportunities that you could look at be both pre and post retirement. Um, cash flow modeling. It's so important to look at that. Um, even when you're planning for clients, should I be going into retirement annuity? What if I save the money I'm getting back from sales? What if I go into unit trust? What if I do a combination of unit trust or retirement annuity? And showing clients the impact of these in real time be, become so important because in that first of the four numbers, the assets number, tax plays a significant role in that. Um, so yeah, I've given you a very short synopsis of what we did, um, but I'm more than happy to, maybe I think we should set up another session for me to come and share the, the full presentation. Uh, we'll also be doing another article and I'm sure that's gonna get a lot of debate, which is fantastic because the one thing we can't have enough of is debate in our industry, uh, it challenges our views, it challenges us to look differently at things. Um, and then I'm also happy to share the slides at some point if someone needs it. But I think I'm always scared of sharing slides without context. Um, yeah, because I think, you know, you build a presentation with a certain narrative and sometimes just sharing slides, you might lose the, the narrative for that. Yeah, I think especially such a technical one because there's a lot of these, like you've got to understand uh, exactly, Tian. Um, and I guess that my, my, my last question to you is because this stuff is phenomenal, right? So even when I looked, I had to look at this a few times and say, ah, yeah, okay, I get it. I get it. Uh, but my main question is like, what is the main takeaway that you want advisors to go and think about and to get from this? I mean, any, any advice, you know, for, for yeah. like in practice? So I, I think the, the, the main thing and, and I challenge my view is that um, don't assume that one vehicle is always appropriate for all clients. Um, I think at minimum do some kind of a cash flow planning, even if it's something as simple as let's assume you're just going to replace your vehicles in retirement and still keep on going on holidays to cater for something like liquidity and then see in your cash flow modeling what vehicle will be best suited for that. Because as an example, if you were to maybe only go into retirement fund, there might be liquidity constraints. Or if you were to only go into a unit trust, you might be 
losing out on, on the on the compound growth or the tax free growth that you might be getting all the tax benefits so i would say the the one piece of advice that I, that i can give which is very generic is do some form of cash flow modeling for all of your clients and you will actually see the tax implications in the vehicle that you select um i think in that alone it's worth the ongoing financial planning fee you're charging. Whether you're charging an hourly rate, whether you're charging a yearly rate, whether you're charging an AUM fee, uh, percentage fee, I really think that that planning alone justifies um, your, your fee. Um, because if you get it wrong, I mean, and, and I can share one or two articles, um, in our case, the first article showed there was a 10-year difference in going into the incorrect vehicle. Now, there's no amount of fees that a financial planner can charge that'll take 10 years of longevity off the off the uh, potential lifespan of a client post retirement um so my only piece of advice is that if i've had to really dumb it down young clients retirement annuity is massively beneficial uh, i mean if you can if you can save the tax saving for clients 40s to 50s that combination becomes quite important and you do want to try and plan for some kind of cash flow planning where you do take into account at least some kind of liquid goals and look at well how much should i be commuting at retirement what is the ideal mix between the two and this mix will change over time um, but it will at least give you some kind of a starting point in modeling and in having this conversation with clients brilliant Tian, uh, I see there is a question from Carol. Uh, if you don't mind answering that in the comments, yeah. maybe when we when we finish, you can answer maybe via text in the comment section. Uh, but just for for everybody's benefit, uh, she did ask whether the outcome would be different if there's also pension and provident funds involved, and not just the retirement annuity. Yeah, hundred percent. It's a it's a great question. So we looked at two um, two scenarios. So the pension and provident fund was one we looked at as well, Carol. Um, I could have gone into that in a bit more detail, but basically what we said in that scenario is that if you are contributing to a pension and provident fund, it means you have more after-tax income than somebody that's obviously now being taxed on the full income contributing less. So in that case, we showed the difference being that the person contributing 20% to their pension and provident fund, they have a higher after-tax income, um, net of the, the contribution, which means that the person that's not contributing as much can only contribute less to the discretionary investments because they're not getting the tax break. So the way we modeled that was saying, person contributing more to pension and provident fund can actually contribute more, maybe 10,000 versus the person who's not making use of their tax breaks, they can only contribute 6,000 rand to a discretionary investment uh, because of the tax benefits that they're giving up. So we did two sets of clients, one retirement annuities, unit trust, other one was pension, provident, and then what do you have left after tax? put that into discretionary. So there was two sets of clients that we looked at. Yeah. But the principles was quite interesting. The principles kind of held held up the same. And that was one of the biggest questions we got from the first article was that you should also be looking at pension and provident funds, which we we did try and do as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Tian, thank you very much. Uh, best place, I would assume, for people to get in touch with you is LinkedIn. Uh, but uh, any other place you prefer people to get a hold of you? I'm uh, I, I am on I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, that's the best place to to get in touch with me, uh, Tian Hatchaman. And I, anytime, love to have a coffee conversation. And yeah, if you've got some some views or contrasting views, would love to hear them. Would love to debate them. And yeah, it just helps us uh, refine our views and as an industry, hopefully, get better. Yeah, um, because I yeah. think the one thing I've learned the last couple of years is any view you might have, um, be always open and willing to change it and be open to learning more. Definitely. Yeah, and it was an amazing discussion. Sorry, we need like two hours. I'm definitely be in touch for us to do a full thing, maybe in propulsion. So uh, I will definitely be in touch. But thank you so much for your time and well done on the great work that you do. Um, again, I'm a big fan of the of the Wealth Integrator tool. Um, I always get the name right because then it's Integrated Wealth and it's Wealth. So anyway, that cash flow modeling tool that you've got is absolutely brilliant. And uh, if you want to see Tian uh, show how you use that in action, uh, we've got that on propulsion uh, in the cash flow summer, cash flow modeling winter camp. It was in winter. So, anyway, thank you very much, Tian. Have a fantastic time. I really uh, enjoyed uh, this segment, and uh, I'll see you soon. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. And, Francia, just I always say this thank you for everything you do for us as well. I think at, at some point, I think that lifetime awards will be going to come your way as well. Yeah. <laughs> All the stuff that you're doing for us, yeah. But thank you very much yeah. for having me. Thanks. I appreciate that, fun. Dion. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All righty. So, brilliant stuff. So, then next up, uh, we're going to do the lucky draw. And uh, really looking forward to, to this part uh, because this is always fun, right? So when we do the uh, spinning of the wheel, 
and uh, you can hear the applause and all of the stuff at the end. So we're going to draw, draw uh, three names, and that's each going to win a little coffee hamper, and uh, that's just to say thank you for completing our uh, technology survey that we did. It was a very brief, short survey just to sort of gather what's up because our tech event is happening in March, and uh, we're obviously busy finalizing the agenda. We want to make sure that we deliver on things that are really, really pertinent to you in your practice. So uh, we're looking forward to that. All right, so I'm going to spin here and see who our first winner is. So there we go. So let's see who is going to be the first winner. Da, 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 da. Let's see. Oh, is it? It's Christoph Radain. Christoph, I'm sure that I don't know if you yet. Doesn't matter. I will uh, be in touch with that. Right. So that's our first winner. And uh, here we go. Our next one. It's quite cool. We've got 94 people in the draw. So we gave you a choice whether you wanted to 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 be entered or not. So we had 110 people respond. And uh, who have we got? And we've got Alex Stewart. So Alex, well done. Congratulations. Um, well done. And then here we go with the last one. Let's see who wins our third and final uh, coffee hamper. Oh, my brain. Come on, brain. You must work. Who is it going to be? Looks like Rian Labaskochni. So, Rian, thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> congratulations. Brilliant. And uh, well done on that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's it for today's show. My guest next week is going to uh, be Melissa Needham from Secure FX. We're going to be talking to her all about foreign exchange and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So, looking forward to that. In the meantime, stay safe, be blessed, and prosper. Have a fantastic weekend and uh, continue to raise the bar. Thank you very much. Have a fantastic weekend. Love you lots. Bye bye.